So, our first speaker today is Antonio Fiore, who's going to be speaking on Shadows of Rome, the classical revival in Italy, which is very close to Antonio's research interests. He is currently a fellow at the Centre for Italian Modern Art downtown, which, uh, and that is in connection with an exhibition on metaphysical painting, Pittura Metaphysica, which you should try and see if you're there. And there's also a discussion evening with Antonio uh, talking on other aspects of design and decoration in the fascist period. I can't remember the date, Antonio. On the 28th of November, which you should uh, look out for. But Antonio comes here to New York hot on the heels of having completed his PhD at the Open University in Britain, where his supervisor was Tim Benton, one of the founders of design history in the old country. So I think we can rest assured that Antonio will be uh, bringing to uh, Italian design in the 1920s and 30s the discipline of the design historian. Please welcome Antonio Fiore. Um, uh, thank you very much, Paul, for uh, inviting me to uh, participate in this um, uh, in this uh, symposium. And um, uh, thank you also, Laura, for the effective organization. Now, um, with this paper, I will consider the revival of styles, techniques, and iconographies related to the idea of Rome in decorative practices developed in Italy during the interwar period. As a case study, I will focus on some works by Giulio Rosso, a decorative artist who was born in Florence in 1987, graduated in Ornato at the local Academy of Fine Arts and moved to Rome. The lasting and fruitful collaboration with architect Marcello Piacentini, which developed between 1921 and 1928, allowed Rosso to establish himself as a successful independent designer of decorative schemes and applied arts, working for the elite, corporations, and public patrons throughout the interwar period. To frame Rosso's output, I will first analyze the work of Gio Ponti, the main personality among those who, after the end of World War I, developed, in, on, in the words of decorative art historians Valerio Terraroli, themes and languages that, while looking at the classical myth and history, reinterpreted them according to the aesthetic dynamics and expectations of modernity. Now, in the uh, multifarious panorama of the rivals of the years after the war, classicism, as the inheritance of the many reincarnations of the myth of Rome, seems to be the common reference of, uh, or idea through which modernity is approached, though translated in many different aesthetic forms. A constant presence in the development of Italian art, this idea of classicism as the true character of the national identity, was eventually appropriated and obsessively reiterated by the fascist propaganda, whose main objective was to design a mythography of Mussolini as new Augustus. A process that starts since the very beginning of Mussolini's rise to power, with the, with the burst made by Adolfo Bild in 1923, which you see on the left-hand side, and reaches its apex with the two millennial Augustan celebrations which culminated in the autumn 1938, when the dictator re-inaugurated re the um, reassembled fragments of Augustus Arapaches. However, by anal analyzing Rosso and Ponti's outputs, I, I aim to challenge the assumption of a period dominated by the one shadow of Augustan Rome. Artists found in the myth and heritage of Rome many different suggestions and possibilities of modern reinterpretation, sometimes even noticeably inconsistent with the triumphalist rhetoric of the regime. In a letter written in May 1923, glass designer Piero Chiesa invi invited sculptor Alibero Andreotti to join a group of artists, architects, and entrepreneurs whose intent was to resurrect Italian decorative arts while, quoting, achieving the modern through the antique, unquote. Now, as often happens in Italy, this project was delayed until 1927 when they founded Il Labirinto, the maze, with architects and designers Emilio Lancia and Gio Ponti. <clears throat> 
um, as written by critic Ferdinando Reggiori, reviewing the Labyrinth Room at the 1927 uh, Monza Biennale of Decorative and Industrial Arts, the works of the group stood out for, quote, an out of ordinary neoclassicism, reminiscent of provincial Roman art, to which the practicality of some British furniture and the taste of some German metal objects have been deliberately added, unquote. For the Labyrintho designers, the revival of previous traditions triggered by the general European return to order assumed an ironic, consciously modern, light-hearted and sensual character. Among these entourage, the key character, able to cross the borders between architecture, painting and decorative arts, thanks to his multifarious interests and technical and organizational skills, was without any doubt Gioponti. In 1928, Joe Ponti began publishing Domus, a magazine that had the aim to guide the, the taste of refined high bourgeoisie audience by presenting and commenting on examples of modern architecture, furnishing, and decorative arts. The editorial article with which Ponti presented the magazine was entitled The House in the Italian Way, and it was introduced by a small drawing by him which represented a stylized figure of an architect in antique-looking clothes with rolled paper and rod supporting a model of a house. The building is characterized by a classical elements arranged in a way that is typical of the architecture of Andrea Palladio, the main reference of the Milanese neoclassicist, celebrated in this same first issue of Domus with a Palladian itinerary outlined by architect Tommaso Buzzi. Terraroli considers this logo as the quintessential expression of Ponti's reference to a generic classical tradition, in particular Palladio, reinterpreted in the light of the experience of secession and modernist architecture. Interestingly, Ponti's represent presentation was flanked by a short uh, uh, piece by the firm uh, partner Emilio Lancia, celebrating Marcello Piacentini's design of Villa Rusconi, of which its late, rena uh, its late renaissance inspired portico facing the garden was illustrated. For Piacentini, the classical lesson had to be reinterpreted through the filter of Baroque architecture, whose distinct character still dominated the current urban texture of Rome. Ponti, instead, through Palladio, looked at the early 19th century Milanese architecture, considered as the last utterance of an uninterrupted dialogue between Italy and the rest of Europe. However, a mythic Rome was the archetype with which they confronted, the tradition that they wanted to update by considering novelties coming from abroad. The reference to a national classical tradition and the will to dialogue with the rest of Europe was not felt as a contradiction. As written by Ma Massimo Bontempelli in 1926, quote, thirsty of universality at the very moment when we strive to be European, we feel deeply Roman, unquote. In opening his magazine to stylistic choices that were strange to a strictly neoclassical inspiration, Ponti was pointing out that there was no unique way to engage with antiquity. The classical conversation or the archaeological stroll could be performed in many different ways. Crucially, it could be carried out also by looking at the results of previous eng engagements with, the, with that repertoire. Renaissance, Manorism, Baroque, 19th century neoclassicism could be all be intended as ways in which past architects and artists had filtered the classical heritage and adapted it to their own aesthetic and practical exigencies. This approach allowed Ponti to liberate his vivid fantasy, infusing classical inspired themes and subjects with a lighthearted spirit, while rendering them in an often eclectic and endearing personal style. The decorative motifs that he designed for the Richard Ginori porcelains between 1923 and 1930 represent the most effective expression of this approach. Both an archaeological stroll and the classical conversation present classical imagery from different periods. References to Roman antiquity, Renaissance, Neoclassicism are collapsed together to express a continuity of creative tension. Columns, urns, candelabra, sundials are set against a partner ground suggesting marble masonry or a mosaic floor decorated with a mysterious symbolic language. Human figures in period-appropriate costumes are designed like mannerist figurines or mannequins, performing a never-ending dance on the round-shaped urns and vases. La conversazione classica, the classical conversation, reinvented the theme of the cista, an antique 
uh, vessel for jewels, often cylindrical, whose main volume was supported by feet and covered with a lid, in this case designed by sculptor Libero Andreotti. It was first presented in 1925 at the Exposition Universelle uh, des Arts Décoratifs et Industriels Modernes in Paris, where Richard Ginori won the Grand Prix. The contrast between Ponti's approach to classicism and that of architect Armando Brasini, as expressed in the latter's pretentious and pompous Italian pavilion, could not be more striking. You can clearly see here the diverse and polymorphous nature of the shadow of Rome uh, that the shadow of Rome set on the Italian cultural context of the 1920s, evoked in objects of different scale and nature as a commune heritage from which a national modern visual language could be hopefully derived, its relaborations expressed instead rather different, almost irreconcilable values and attitudes. Let's go back to Domus. Uh, on the cover of the first issue, uh, Ponti decided to present the magazine with a work by Giulio Rosso, on whose output I'm going to focus now. Rosso's uh, composition must have appealed to Gio Ponti. It represented a group of people in an interior, some uh, playing cards, a young woman at the piano, and a man nearby singing or maybe uh, flirting with her. Their clothes recall the fashion of the early 19th century, a vase, a chandelier, a drape, and a classical statue holding an eagle top labarum placed on a pedestal complete the scene. Terraroli, analyzing the work, interpreted it as an expression of Ponti's agenda, quote, the overcoming of traditional furniture and simpering atmospheres replaced by a recall to the grandiosity and simplicity of the classical tradition with an eye for the artistic avant-garde, unquote. Now, I don't really... Um, follow this interpretation. Uh, that's because, the, for me, I mean, the statue is pointing at the party's attendees and its face is turned towards them as expressing a desire of engagement, dialogue and connection. But at the same time, the distance between the, the elegant members of the party and the heroic nude and the indifference shown by the car character descending the stairs, which has got a roller piece of paper under the arm, highlight the problems that such engagement inevitably raised. This interpretation seems to be confirmed by the analysis of the decorative scheme of which this work was part, depicted by Rosso in Marcello Pescentini's Quirinetta restaurant and theater in Rome in 1925. The restaurant consisted of six spaces of different dimensions, each characterized by a different decorative scheme. Rosso was in charge of one of the restaurant's room, the Hall of the Gold Old Days also a vestibule called Hall of Cheerfulness and a small theater all carried out during 1924-1925. The overall concept of the restaurant aimed to provide a visual divertissement where diners, according to their wishes, could find themselves immersed in different epochs. In the Hall of the Good Old Days, scenes recalled the themes, settings and atmospheres of decorative prints from the European Restoration period. The sketches present post-Napoleonic life as picturesque sequence of parties, pageantry, courtships, among details recalling motifs used in 18th century girandoles or print room wallpapers featuring vignettes with landscapes, picturesque ruins and fat galants, a detail strikes for its unconventionality. It is part of a large composition representing a wedding parade and represents a boy urinating against a classical statue placed in front of an ancient ruin. It is strategically placed just on the left-hand side of the scene which appeared on Domus cover. The detail was promptly noted by writer Eugenio Giovannetti, who decided to illustrate an article celebrating the humorous vein of Rosso's work with a drawing reproducing the irreverent vignette. Now, besides the amusing facts of uh, inserting in a mural decoration of a restaurant the, the detail of a boy urinating, I find interesting the fact that the object of desecration is again a classical statue, whose antiquity and reverence is further enhanced by the presence of the ruin of a triumphal arch behind. Rosso seems to denounce the fact that Although constantly evoked and celebrated, the classical spirit was still misunderstood, neglected, and even offended by modern creative practices. It is a way to remark a difficult relationship. At the same time, I have the impression that his sneering at the audience, supposedly scandalized reaction, with an attitude that was very much informed by an invite not to take the issue too seriously. The words written by Margherita Sarfatti in 1923 
to review Ponti's porcelains seems to be relevant here. Quote, classical motifs were reinterpreted with an acute satirical grace, a caricature exaggeration that is very local and modern, which makes its effect more striking without compromising the line. In a few words, a not taken very seriously classicism. Unquote. Rosso had already showed a rather jaunty approach towards the revival of classical iconographies. In Piacentini's Roma Ostia railway station, he had decorated with graffiti the internal walls of the main hall, depicting sea-themed scenes populated with mythological figures. In his interpretation of the Theasos, the parade of Poseidon and the, and the Nereids, the god seems to trip over his dolphin, sneaking below his leg, in a rather clumsy way. In the Savoia dancing hall, in Florence, the consul Lucullus, famous for his sumptuous banquets, it is represented as a, an aged pot-bellied man served by an unimpressed modern waiter. In another space of the Quirinetta, the small theater, which was located in the basement, Rosso depicted still lifes arranged in complex architectural stages inspired by, Pompe inspired by Pompeian frescoes. They functioned as fantastic theatrical stages where symbolic objects or small genus scenes could be placed and static, mysterious plays were performed. In Rosso's Lender Puppet Theatre, strange visual rebuses play on the interference between antiquity and modernity. The classical divinities inhabiting these spaces are turned into porcelain art de statuettes modeled on those reinvented by Gio Ponti. That Ponti considered Rosso's schemes for the Quirinetta a compelling embodiment of his own ideas is confirmed by the fact that in March 1928 he published in Domus other details of this scheme to illustrate his own recipe, recipe for contemporary decorative arts. For Ponti, Rosso had achieved an effective re-elaboration of the classic heritage because he had filtered it through a modern sensibility, it asked, with humor. I'm convinced that humor was used by both Rosso and Ponti to establish a distance from the past while appropriating it. They wanted to be modern and yet they needed tradition. The only way to connect with the past without betraying their aspirations to novelty was to subvert slightly the rules of continuity. In other words, to play with the tradition. The renewed interest in Italian mannerists, which is evident in both Ponti and Rosso's works, might have stemmed from this conscious process of reworking of older examples. In the 16th century, artists did much the same thing with the classical tradition rediscovered during the Renaissance. However, in considering Rosso's humorous reinterpretation of the classical heritage, one should not overlook the fact that many of these schemes were intended for spaces with a leisure function. Decoration is a creative practice that should always be considered in close relationship with the nature, function, and scope of the architecture or the object that is hard to connote. It is the result of a negotiation among the different expectations of patrons, architects, and the decorators themselves. If we move our attention to another typology of space, such as domestic interiors, we will see that Rosso's evocation of Rome and its heritage had to change in order to respond to a brief that had, to com that had the communication of prestige and social status at its core. For example, the interiors of the Casa Botti in Rome um, use the same inspiration, Pompeii frescoes with grotesques, but there is no humor here. The, the, the interpretation and the design of Rosso is quite literal. Uh, an interesting case is the Casa Ricordi in Milan, 1938. Here Rosso engaged with a typically Roman technique of the mosaic. In the patio leading to the terrace garden, the decorator gave a particularly interesting interpretation of yet another Roman genre, the Xenia. This typology of floor decoration presented geometrically framed still lifes representing the owner's gifts to his guests. Animals, alive and dead, food and drinks, masks and games, and gen scenes. The Xenia were generally displayed in representative space around the peristyle facing the villa's internal garden. Rosso revived the genre for the liminal area between the interiors of the flat and its open air terrace. Themes of wealth and generosity resonated with the exclusive and cultured guests of the Ricordi family, 
while the insertion of unconventional motifs such as uh, feminine hands, which is a quintessentially Pontian theme, geometrical and abstract patterns probably borrowed from Libyan textiles, and a highly stylized and vivid representation of female masks attested to the householder's modern taste. Another example of Rosso's use of classical theme to communicate social status in, is the mural for the Villa La Loggetta in Naples, designed by architect Marcello Canino in 1934. Murals decorated the a music room, uh, which was quite an, uh, an important space in the house because um, uh, the landlord loved to receive his guests there and play the cello. Um, frescoes represented scenes inspired by the Odyssey and the myth of the mermaid Parthenope. This classical and mythological repertoire resonated with the style of the architecture. Canino, the architect, had designed the house as a modern reinterpretation of Roman suburban villa. Rosso drew on the long established tradition in which the feats of mythological heroes were used to associate, part, to associate a pattern with specific values and virtues. In this case, Ulysses' ingenuity, bravery, and spirit of adventure. The legend of Parthenope offered a further reading. According to the story, after being rejected by Ulysses, the mermaid killed herself and her corpse was washed ashore on the coast of Campania, becoming part of the land on which Naples was later founded. So the natural and artificial elements of the decorative landscape constituted a mise en scene that simultaneously functioned as a learned evocation of the past, a way of expressing the identity of the patron by identifying him with heroic traits, and an assertion of the patron's belonging to and control over a specific territory, the Gulf of Naples. It also enforced a relationship with the physical territory already inherent in the architecture. The gulf and city could be admired through the windows of the house, creating an immediate visual connection between past and present, the landlord and the vast territory at his feet. These schemes were all made for spaces that, within the household, were specifically dedicated to the relationship between the family and the exterior where the communication of the household cultural, social, and economic status was paramount. Rosso's decorative schemes served the purpose of expressing, through direct reference to antiquity, a set of values that could be, from time to time, either updated with a modern stylization and reference to contemporary artistic trends, or reasserted through a less adventurous and more faithful interpretation. It is interesting now to examine how the idea of Rome and its cultural heritage was used by Rome when he engaged with the patron, public, a public patron, thus participating in the process of visualization and communication of the fascist ideology. In order to introduce this last part of the paper, I will pull a curtain designed by Rosso for a space strangely in between a private dimension and a public one. The Palestra del Duce was designed by architect Luigi Moretti in 1936 in the Forum Mussolini, the modernist sport complex built by the regime in North Rome. It was supposed to be Mussolini's private gym, a gift to the dictator from the powerful head of the Opera Nazionale Ballilla, Renato Ricci. Thus, a private space devoted to the cult of physical strength. However, the space was never used as such and apparently it was despised by Mussolini himself. Instead, it featured widely in newspapers and magazines of the sign, which celebrated its modernist design, the luxury of the natural and artificial materials used, and the beauty of the works of art and decoration opportunately distributed. As a whole, Mussolini's gym could be considered as a manifesto of the aesthetic pluralism allowed by the fascist regime, a modernist space with classical reference which coexisted with works of abstract art, such as the cubist mosaic designed by Gino Severini from, uh, and placed in front of the lift landing. Rosso's curtain was a piece of celebrity art. At its center, a figure of Hercules features with a lion at its feet, a clear reference to the Lion of Judah, symbol of the Ethiopian emperor as descendant of King Solomon. This was an obvious reference to the conquest of Ethiopia after the military aggression that started in autumn 1935 and ended with the capitulation of Addis Ababa in May 1936. 
The lion was an ambiguous symbol because it was also Mussolini's own astrological sign. For this reason, it features also on the upper right corner, while the other two are occupied by Pegasus and an ancient looking boat. Reference to the fascist Italian ambition to dominate the air and over the seas. The lion symbol is ubiquitous in the Forum Mussolini, constantly appearing in its double connotation as a metaphor of submission. Uh, when associated with Hercules, like in Achille Capizzano's sketch for the etching decoration, uh, decorating the surface of Mussolini's desk, as a celebration of Mussolini's strength and courage in Rosso's mosaics along the celebrative thoroughfare that connected Mussolini's obelisk with the sphere fountain in the sportive complex. Here, tens of thousands of square meters of surface were covered with black and white mosaics. Recalling the mosaics that were excavated at the same time in Ostia, the ancient arbor city of Rome. In this case, even the materials represented a declared reference to Rome and its heritage. Nevertheless, the response of the four artists involved in this massive enterprise was quite varied. Severini introduced strange cubist shapes which fragment the general figurative approach while also enlarging or diminishing the scale of objects represented with total metaphysical effects. Rosso's The Balilla's Oath and the Proclamation of the Empire showed how fascism had brought the spirit of Mars and Hercules rather than Apollo back into the history of modern Italy. However, rather than a plain narrative approach, Rosso chose a fragmented college-like trope in which the observer was left with the task of completing the narrative and give sense to the associations. This college approach evolved towards an almost cinematographic editing in the Proclamation of the Empire panel. Here, in the middle of the space, there is a sentence in bold, le in bold letters, uh, which can be translated as uh, May the 9th, 1936, 14th of the fascist era, Italy finally has got its empire. The quotation was the acme of Mussolini's speech as he addressed the crowds gathered in Piazza Venezia three days after General Badoglio's entry into Addis Ababa. Around Mussolini's words, Rosso arranged mechanical as well as allegorical figures, soldiers in battle at work, one holding the national flag in front of the Ethiopian, of an Ethiopian raising his hands in the fascist salute. This catalogue of images are drawn from contemporary mass media, including newspapers, the Istituto Luce, newsreels. A compelling anthology of these materials appeared in the documentary Il Cammino degli Eroi, which was presented at the 1936 Mostra del Cinema di Venezia, where it won the fascist party cup. Before watching airplanes and tractors in the battlefield, spectators were shown how they were assembling factories, shipped to Mogadishu and Massawa, and transported to the Ethiopian border on new roads and railway tracks constructed by soldiers. After only seven minutes of actual fighting in a 60-minute film, Badoglio enters Addis Ababa. The documentary ends with the Italian flag raised among saluting Ethiopian hands and the proclamation of the empire, three days later at night in a Piazza Venezia crowded with people. As in the documentary, machines took central stage in Rosso's panel to express Italian technological superiority. Italian soldiers are represented overcoming logistical difficulties by building infrastructures. They have lost no time in their mission of civilization. There is no trace of resistance. Rosso's animals have allegorical aims. The Lion of Judah is finally tamed, while the airplanes are coupled with Roman imperial eagles, once again using an antique symbol to re-signify ideologically an otherwise natural piece of technology. The physical presence of the dictator's body is transcended. It becomes an abstract entity, only words set into mosaics. Rosso's mosaic photo college aimed at producing a multi-sensory experience of déjà vu in his audience. These fragmentary compositions relied on the observers to make sense of them. The absence of narrative and the college-like pastiche of images produced by the control and media contributed to a paratactic structure, the favorite structure of populist interpolation. At the same time, by translating these phantasmagoria mosaics, Rosso visualized the premises of fascist imperial ideology, retracing the path that had been followed by Roman legions. I'd like to conclude my overview with an episode in which the reference to Rome, rather than support the imperial ideology, seems to slightly undermine it. 
Similar episodes are limited but not rare, and they tend to be found in temporary rather than permanent contexts. As noted by Giuseppe Pagano in 1941, the ephemeral nature of propagandistic exhibition was a pivotal factor for modern architects and designers, enabling them to experiment with a frank and functionalist visual language. For the triennial exhibition of the overseas territories in Naples, Rosso contributed mural paintings to two galleries in the Romantica sul Mare Pavilion, ancient Rome on over the sea. This was the title of a lecture given by Mussolini at the University of Perugia, in which he reconstructed the phases of Roman expansion, quoting ancient writers. Rosso reconstructed Mussolini's storytelling, associating maps with quotations and statuettes representing the traditional arts of populations that in various periods had dominated the sea. The sequence of maps synthesizes the historical account into stages of an unstoppable expansion. The quotation from ancient sources supported the images, while the pieces of art defined populations that sooner or later were subjugated by the Romans as others, bearers of different, ostensibly non-classical visual culture. Rosso featured a statuette of the god Baal Amon and a theatrical mask from Cartago as example of Phoenician art, for example. Yet, in the mural, the Romans master of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean on the uh, left-hand side, a collage of sculpted portraits of emperors and a figure of the to the right, perhaps depicting a young Neptune sanctioning their dominion over the sea, they, these are drawn with a coarseness that recall barbaric copies from the peripheral provinces of the empire rather than refined classicism of the official Augustan art. At the same time, the characters who accompany Aeneas into Sicily, Cume, and Lazio are depicted in a way that seems to highlight their humble humanity rather than their heroism. Once again, Rosso adapts techniques borrowed from other fields. These murals were interpreted display solution used in earlier propaganda exhibitions. Rosso's imperial portraits, for example, recall photographic portraits assembled by Marcello Nizzoli in the Salone della Vittoria of the 1936 Triennale. In his combination of statues, maps, and text, Rosso deliberately translates into visual images the design of the Mostra Augustea della Romanità. The decorator told the story using the mechanisms and solutions adopted by historians and archaeologists to reconstruct history as the regime wanted it told. Yet, while the Mostra Augustea della Romanità aimed to display the best examples of the quintessentially classical arts of the Augustan period, Rosso's Romanitas is anti-classical. In this case, he sides with the painters of the Scuola Romana, who were experimenting with alternative ways of reinterpreting the myth of Rome in their engagements with public art. Cagli, Corrado Cagli's panels for the Italian pavilion of the, 90, of the 1937 Paris World Exhibition are an example of an approach that, rather than referencing illustrious works and knowledge as canonical model, looks at popular and folk sources, primordial way of expressions, magical, almost surreal visions in its attempt to resurrect Rome in the present. The idea of Rome has been a constant reference in Italian culture long before the city became the capital of the independent and united country as we know it today, almost 150 years ago. Its myth is a recurrent topic which, which comes up every now and then, like springs along the course of a subterranean river. Every time it resurges, it takes a different shape, showing an extraordinary ability of adaptation to diverse exigencies of those who trigger, support, discuss, use, and materialize its reincarnations. Yet, um, the singularity of Italian context where, as Kenneth Silver wrote, fascism was the only dictatorship supporting a modernist culture, invites the scholar to challenge any pre-assumptions. The revival of the myth of Rome was varied in its results. Each of them, in order to be understood, must be analyzed, considering the question of commission, pattern, space, contemporary trends, expectations and functions. Like Rosso's Rome wallpaper for the 1932 Triennale in Mionza, Roma was not just the city turned in marble by Augustus and which Mussolini wanted to emulate. It could be a playful game of theatrical backdrops, Renaissance, medieval, antique, baroque, neoclassicist, interspersed with fountains and famous pines, continuously sliding according to the piece played onto the stage, the creative brief of the decorators and their need to survive. Thank you. <laughs>